Hello and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kukin Wiener, architect for Zephyr Harmony. I would officially like to welcome you all to the very first session of our webinar series, Rethinking Architectural Education in South Asia. The first session of the series is called and revolves around realities of architecture and education. And I would now like to welcome Chairman Institute of Architect Pakistan Karachi Chapter, Architect Ramit Bey, to say a few words and officially introduce the session to us all. Good afternoon, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. It gives me real pleasure to invite, to welcome you all here today for our first session of this uh, Rethinking Architectural Education in South Asia webinar series. As we all know, during the pandemic that we have been facing worldwide, so many questions have popped up in our minds. We are all wondering what the new normal is gonna be and we're all wondering when that is gonna be. One of the most important things that impacts us all is of course education, and then of course the role of architecture education. And we feel that in the new normal that is coming on upon us, there will be a few changes. We have a wonderful lineup of panelists today, and we will continue to have a wonderful lineup of panelists and experts in the coming sessions as well. Through this discussion, we hope to reach some sort of an idea of where we are headed, where we are today, and what to expect in the coming months. Before we begin, of course, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome our president of the Institute of Architects Pakistan, Arif Changezi Saab. Sir, if you would please like to come on and say a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful session. I hope it's enjoyable for you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ramis. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, everybody, uh, and a very good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure indeed for me to, uh, to welcome all, you all on behalf of the Institute of Architects Pakistan uh, in the webinar series being conducted jointly by Board of Architectural Education and Institute of Architects uh, Pakistan Karachi chapter. Uh, I'm very happy and grateful to, to all the distinguished international and national panelists, uh, including renowned architects from academia and, uh, and profession, who have joined us today to share their knowledge and experience uh, on rethinking architectural education in South Asia. Uh, with changing times and situation, uh, the theme is becoming even more uh, relevant and, uh, and need of our, uh, and the need of the hour. Uh, I'm very glad they are getting an opportunity to have this, uh, um, these discussions today and also in the next two sessions. Uh, COVID-19, as we all know, uh, has had an influence on teachers and students alike, uh, thus impacting the, the, uh, the, the, the future of uh, architectural education, not only in our region, but also uh, all over the world. Uh, I'm very sure uh, while we discuss the prevailing trends of the architectural education in South Asia, uh, we must also keep it in mind uh, uh, that innovation, restructuring, and adaptations are critical uh, and required not only uh, on part of the universities, but also the accreditation uh, bodies so that we can bridge the gap between academia and practice and encouraging the multidisciplinary thinking. Uh, my message as the, uh, as the president of Institute of Architects Pakistan would be to be, to be more flexible and adaptable to the changing times and encourage uh, the type of discourse that we are having today. Uh, and uh, that not only questions our method of teaching, but also suggest ways we can improve our education system. I'm sure we'll be able to see a very productive sessions of interesting and stimulating discussions in this session uh, on realities of architectural education and practice. I thank you all of you for joining us today. Thank you, President Arif Tungesi. Uh, I'm the convener, I'm the co-convener of Summer Zara, and I would like to take this opportunity to uh, introduce our moderators of the session. Our first moderator is architect Nabali Saad. 
Nabali Saad graduated from NCA Lahore in 2008 after completing her master's degree with a core focus in urbanism from the Saudi Institute of Architecture in Germany. She has been an assistant professor at Comsat Lahore since 2015. Our second moderator is Michal Merchant. Michal Rosina Merchant is a practicing architect, founder of Studio Ecomorp, which is an interdisciplinary team investigating city morphosis. Her favorite discipline being landscape urbanism, which in which she has presented two internationally peer-reviewed papers. She has worked on projects in Pakistan, USA, Afghanistan, UAE, and Qatar. She has taught at NED, an Indus Valley School of Art and Architecture, and still serves as visiting faculty. Over to you, moderator. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first session. Um, I'd like to begin uh, with uh, a brief, as a brief uh, introduction of our panelists has already been given. Um, following each, uh, I will begin by giving a brief uh, introduction of our panelists. Following each introduction, I will invite the panelists to say a few brief words and screen share any presentations that they may have. Um, while the panelists are presenting, should any of our participants have any questions, I would like to request that you please use the question and answer box for your queries. We will sort through the questions and raise them in the dialogue session following the presentations. Please note that only questions written in the question and answer box will be considered and not those written in the chat box. I'd like to begin by introducing architect Rahul Merothra. Rahul is the founding principal of RMA Architects and the professor of urban design and planning at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He studied at the School of Architecture Ahmedabad and graduated with a master's degree in urban design with distinction from Harvard Graduate School of Design in 1987. Apart from his engagement with the design of buildings, Rahul Merotra has been actively involved in civic and urban affairs in Mumbai. Having served on various commissions for historic preservation and environmental issues, along with neighborhood groups. Um, I'd like to now invite architect Rahul Mehrotra to please share his screen and present his views at the topic at hand. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Naba. You can hear me now. Is, is this good? Yes, perfect, please. Thank you so much for your kind words and introductions and thank you uh, to the Pakistan Institute of Architects and all the office bearers for this very kind invitation. I'm absolutely honored. It's lovely to see old friends. Uh, and so thank you again to, to invite me to be part of this conversation. I think what you have set up as these three conversations is incredibly relevant uh, and very exciting too. Uh, because it's a great opportunity for us to collectively reflect uh, about South Asia. And I think when you pose the question of reality, the realities of architectural education and practice, I think that's a very perfectly framed question uh, because the two intersect. The education is to prepare practitioners, uh, but then there also has to be feedback loops between the realities of practice and education. And so I'm starting with this sort of first slide that I've put up there, which is called the context of the context, because I think as architects, we often are taught uh, to understand the context we work in. Uh, and that context we often bring down to uh, the site, the materiality of the site, uh, the climate, uh, the, the skills that exist. Uh, some of us who are more ambitious go into questions of culture to define the context. Uh, we dig into embedded histories of the site, uh, again, if we bring that ambition. And it's some good education actually could see to do that. The question we often don't ask is, what is the context of the context? Because each one of these sort of uh, framings or constructions or imaginaries uh, of the context also sits in its context. And that broader context is a context of politics, of, 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 of society, and our society is sort of evolving, uh, of cultural production of different kinds. Uh, and it's much more complex for us to understand. But it's critical that education actually equips us to do that because it's 
at that intersection of our understanding of the context, the materiality, the, 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 the tangible context and the intangible context is where the real questions and the challenges lie. And so really what basically uh, uh, tends to happen uh, is that, uh, is, is, you know, we, we develop a kind of sphere of concern, uh, which is uh, the concern for this larger context, right? So we are concerned about climate change. We're concerned about inequities in our societies. We're concerned about a number of things. But then our sphere of influence is actually often very small. And, and it's strange, most often when your sphere of influence expands, I mean, when your sphere of concern expands, actually it's inversely proportionate to your sphere of influence, which actually diminishes. So the question is how can education provide us to create these intersec intersections, but also allow us to calibrate and keep in some balance the spheres of our concerns and the spheres of our influence. Now, I don't mean that we should diminish our spheres of concern because we must be very ambitious. We must be ambitious to change the world around us, but then we must find ways that we have a voice, we have agency, that education provides us with that, that pedagogical frameworks make us think about how we can keep expanding that influence strategically. And therefore, what is that agency that architects and architecture might happen? And so, of course, this is a lecture in itself and a complex conversation, and I hope we have it over these three sessions. But I want to share with you three pieces of research which opened my mind in interesting ways uh, to these questions. <laughs> so the first was these two books that I did. One was a book that, uh, and by the way, for me, books become instruments to advocate not only to society as an architect, but also to advocate to myself about what my concerns should be. And so this first book looked at South Asia. And so this was done in, 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 in the year 1998, 2000, uh, which is what what connected me to South Asia, which, um, which, which gave me the blessing to have a lot of friends around South Asia and understand this broader context beyond India where my practice was situated to understand the geographies that actually make this broader context. And then many years later, or rather 10 years later, I did a book called Architecture in India since 1990, which was when we liberalized our economy. And I was trying to understand what does it mean for the architect in a post-liberalized economy uh, in India and reflecting about it. And, you know, I, uh, there were, there were, there were, there were many, many uh, lessons I learned from this, but really for me, the biggest lesson that emerged, which I think is relevant for our discussion and for education, is that there is no singular model of practice. Uh, education in the business as usual way, often perpetuated by the policy and the regulatory frameworks that we establish through institutes and councils and things, and for very good reason, actually have a single model of practice uh, it, central to their imagination. And so basically by, by, by what I essentially did was I removed the lens of modernism and I said, what do I see on the landscape in India? And it was amazing, you know, you saw glass stars that were not modern as we define it uh, in the more traditional way. Uh, one saw things that were being built uh, by very sensitive practitioners very mindful of locality, which I call regional manifestations. Global practice is implicit. Uh, I call it expressions of impatient capital because capital drives the decisions because capital is inherently impatient. I, I, I looked at a model called alternate practices, which is the kind of barefoot architect model. I mean, Laurie Baker in India, Kamil Khan Mumtaz uh, in, in Pakistan, working straight with a craftsman. Uh, I mean, it's the whole mode of uh, instruction, the mode of communication, changes. We're not prepared through education for that. And then counter-modernism, which is the resurfacing of ancient practices and ancient uh, imagery. The big temples that are being built in India, the mosques in Pakistan and, you know, elsewhere. And so it made me think that actually there are many models of practice. And the question then becomes, does education prepare us for all those models? Or are we narrowing the perception of students by actually making preparing them with just one lens, so one set of protocols and processes that allow buildings to manifest themselves on the ground? Yeah. And so then that was extended as an exhibition called The State of Architecture in India. 
And I, I mean, there were again, many things that came out of this, but I want to point out just one. I'm sorry if you can't see this clearly, but if you see in this image, there are these columns that show uh, names of different things. And you see only two or three names in the beginning and you see about 428 names at the end. And so the beginning is 1947 with our independence and the fracturing of South Asia into different nation states. And the last column shows you the number of schools of architecture today. So we had two or three in 47, we have 428 now. Now what's interesting is there's a blue line which starts at 1990 that you see rising here. You can barely see it, but the line is actually rising just above these columns, which means that, and that is a line that represents real estate as an organized um, uh, sector. Uh, and so as real estate as an organized sector grows, you see actually the schools of architecture growing proportionately. Now, this is very interesting because actually this is a complete myth that with the growth of real estate, we need more schools of architecture because what parents do when they're driving around, they start seeing big townships coming up and they say, oh my God, my son or my daughter should study architecture. But actually the need for architects is inversely proportionate to the growth of real estate because as the sector gets more organized, they actually employ less architects because a, a, a defense colony uh, would have 500 houses and it would employ 200 architects. Whereas a gated community would have 2000 homes and families but they would employ one in-house architect. So this, these are myths. Actually, we should be controlling the number of schools of architects architecture and focusing them in different ways. And then the last piece of research takes the question even broader, which is what is even urban? Because we prepare architects for the urban context. Often we don't prepare architects so much, I believe, for the rural context. But is that binary even valid? I don't think the binary is even valid. And this is the new research where I'm kind of actually arguing that India's urbanization uh, is about 37% for six months of the year and over 47 or 50% for the other six months of the year, which means we have a couple of million people who move back and forth. And so these two maps show you the official imagination of the urban, which is the big red dots. But if you take settlements that are just 5,000 people and above settlements, we have about 32,000 settlements. So there's a gap of 23,000 places that people are not focusing on. And architects should, that should be the constituency for architects and education should focus on preparing us. And I can talk to that later, which is what influenced my work on the Kumbh which is called, the, I called it the, 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 the ephemeral mega city, which extended into this question of ephemeral urbanism, because I think the biggest challenge for us as practitioners, if you talk about that reality and therefore how should education prepare us, is that we have to design for flux. The reverse migration that happened, at least in India, I don't know the figures in other parts of South Asia of 30 million people going back home in two weeks, just shows us what I'm talking about that happens across the year, actually happened in two weeks. So it was only 30 million. Otherwise, it would have been 200 million, right? So the question is, does permanence matter? Is permanence too much of a default condition that we are training architects for? How can we design for flux? And therefore, how, so if you, if you accept flux is our condition, then that is the context of the context. And so every decision we make as architects then has to be placed in these broad, broader rhythms. And then the question becomes, is education preparing students adequately for this condition? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rahul, for that very, very interesting presentation. And we have got some very good talking points from that as well. Um, next up, uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, architect uh, Jivanti Sinadhira um, from Sri Lanka. Um, architect uh, Jivanti completed her Bachelor's of Science in Built Environment from the University of Moratova in Colombo in 2002, from where she also did her Master's degree in Architecture three years later. She is a member of the Sri Lankan Institute of Architects and is currently a senior lecturer at the City School of Architecture in Colombo. She is also a practicing architect and works as an associate for the firm ID, Chartered Architects in her hometown. Now I'd like to invite architect Jivanti to present her, to please share her screen and present her views on the topic at hand. And uh, Jivanti, I would also like to request if you could ensure that your screen is set to full screen mode. Thank you. Yes, thank you.
Uh, Javanti, can you turn it to full screen? We're looking at a preview right now. Yes. I'm on full screen. Can you see? Hello, I'm on full screen. Now. Can you can you end uh, slideshow? Uh, no, Jivanti, you'll have to go to display settings and you'll have to switch because you are seeing the full screen, but we are seeing the uh, display. Go up and uh, click on the arrow. This says display settings. It's on the top tab, second option. Right above your slide? Yeah. Uh, on the left? Is it OK now? Yeah. No, no, no. If you go on to the left, you take your cursor on to the left. Yeah. This setting. Okay. Next one. This place it yeah. is. Right. OK. Yeah, and that's that's the one. Yeah. Swap this. Excellent. Right. Yeah. Thank Perfect. you very much. I actually didn't know that. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay, thank you, Naba, for a very generous introduction. And uh, architect Mohamed Arif, chairman, Institute of Architects Pakistan, and architect Ramiz Beij, chairman of chairman, Institute of Architects Karachi chapter, and all other distinguished panelists, webinar co-hosts, and moderators. for bearing participants, listeners. Good evening. And thank you very much for having me here for this very timely discussion. Today, um, I decided to spend my given eight minutes, very briefly, asking a few open questions. Of course, not demanding any immediate answers, by throwing out a few speculations I heard on the focus of architecture education ever since I was interested in it. Rather be an attempt to trace the trajectory of architecture education, just to ascertain if that needs to empower architects to face the future or to form the future. start with this. The royal palace of last Sinhalese monarchy in Sri Lanka, present day venerated abode for the Lord Buddha's tooth relic and the UNESCO World Heritage, temple of sacred tooth relic, Kandy, Sri Lanka. The historic accounts of this mesmerizing architectural masterpiece is vivid and colorful. This has been originally started in early 1700s, but was finally brought to this magnificence somewhere in 1802 under the patronage of the last king of Sinhalese monarchy, Sri Vikramarajasi. According to the historical records, King Sri Vikramarajasi, who measured himself as a god, assigned his royal chief artificer, architect, Devendra Mulacharya to create a royal weaving platform for him to address the nation and observe the public. The story. Monty, goes, can you speak a bit louder, please? Thank you. Yes, I think I can. Yeah. That can you hear me now? Yes. So, according to the historical records, King Sri Vikramaraja Singh, who measured himself as a god, assigned his royal artificer, architect, Devendra Mulachare, to create a royal weaving platform for him to address the nation and observe the public. The story goes that the king ordered him to design this among the clouds as the abode of the goods. So, Devendra Mulachare, who is considered as the most gifted Sinhalese architect in the history, went on to have 19 hectare paddy field in front of the palace filled with water to be an artificial lake, 
surrounding the perimeter with decorative wall with abstract clouds called Valakurubamma or the cloud wall. You can see it here. I will just find it. Cloud wall. And finally, place in the octagonal royal weaving tower, Pattiripur, at the foot of the lake, thus personifying the king's palace as God's abode, which floated among the clouds and reflected on the land. So, even today, in the misty morning or a mystic evening, over the cloud wall of the lake, this comes to life. A great abode of king floating above the terrain. And this was approximately 180 years prior to Alexander Zuni's or Kenneth Hampton speculated on critical regionalism or critical contextualism. But this is how Colombo, just 100 kilometers away from Kandy, is seen today, along with Shanghai, London, Singapore, Melbourne, Nairobi, even with New York, east or west. They stand back to back resembling like siblings of the same family. So, I wonder, what if we taught our own architects proud descendants of Devendra Mulachare to make our skylines really ours. Among those soaring multi-story housing, where all life flowed within 500 square feet and culture and society was confined in the architecture itself, I wonder what if we taught our architects to be sensitive. Inside those closer glazed geometries whose artificial ventilation systems fight with tropical sun, making huge holes in the Earth's protective sky layer, I wonder what if we taught our architects to be interrogative and thus countable. In those complex tangle of roadways, where motorized movement governs and simple life is cheapened, I wonder what if we taught our architects to be engaged. And beyond those fringes of the city in the back alleys of the neighborhoods where life struggles under the self-assembled pockets, I wonder what if we taught our architects to be inclusive. Finally, I wonder what if we taught our architects to form the future of architecture within the silent cause of culture, society, and humanity, rather than face it with alienated artifices devoid of them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuanti. Uh, Definitely something to think about. Um, now, I would like to uh, invite our uh, next panelist, architect Akil Bilgrami. Uh, architect Akil Bilgrami is architect Akil Bilgrami uh, is the oh, sorry one second yeah a fellow of the Institute of Architects Pakistan and a life registered member of the Pakistan Council of Architects and Town Planner. He has long and he has long been closely associated in the affairs of both these organizations. Um, from 1968 to 1972, uh, he worked with Nakvi and Siddiqui and then thereafter started his own practice, first as Bilgrami and Associates and then as AE firm Bilgrami and Farooqi in partnership with engineer Farooq Sultan. 
In 2006, Najmi Bil Rami collaboration, a collaborative private limited, was established with the pooling of resources of Bil Rami, Faruqi, and Misbah Najmi and Associates. Architect Akil Bil Rami is one of the founders of the Indus Valley School of Arts and Architecture (IVS) in Karachi, which was established in 1990 and has been on the board of governors and twice served as the chairman of the executive committee. I would now like to invite Architect Akil Bil Rami to say a few words on the topic at hand. Thank you. Akil Saab, I would also like to request you to turn your video on, please. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Naba, uh, for that introduction, and I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the Institute of Architects, Pakistan Karachi Chapter, and the Board of Architectural Education um, Chair Khadija for uh, uh, inviting me and for hosting this. webinar uh, i would like to mention these three young um, uh, architects who are behind the scenes uh, there's maryam nabi uh, samar zehra and uh, huzaifa harun wonderful work very proud of you to put architectural education in pakistan in proper perspective it is necessary to narrate a brief history um as it evolved over the years formal training of architects in pakistan is a recent phenomenon and can be traced to the legacy that the british left behind the raj had established two notable schools of art and crafts in the latter half of the 19th century there is one in lucknow in india and the other in lahore with the aim to preserve sustain and patronize local crafts the one in lahore known as the mayo school of art has at, as its founding principal lockwood kipling the father of the uh, famous novelist uh, rudyard kipling who was a strong believer in the preservation and promotion of indigenous crafts Mayo School adequately served the purpose of its establishment, and for several uh, decades, trained artisans in different building trades. Incidentally, architectural historian Percy Brown and Bhai Ram Singh were amongst the earlier principals of Mayo uh, at the turn of the century. Bhai Ram Singh, as uh, most of you are aware was an accomplished wood craftsman and a brilliant architect who designed some of the finest buildings in lahore in the indo colonial style buildings that still inspire a testimony to his ingenuity as an outstanding designer but it was not until after 1947 that a three year diploma course in architecture was introduced at mayo that was meant to produce architectural assistance for employment in relevant building control authorities and design offices in the local government and to serve in the offices of the engineers and the few architects who were in practice the first school of architecture in karachi offering a four year evening program was established in 1954 uh, by the pwd department for much the same purpose to, to produce architectural assistance mayo school which was renamed national college of arts in 1960 uh, in 1958 revised its, its curricula and upgraded the architecture course to an integrated five year program with the first batch of students graduating in 1963 at about the same time departments of architecture were set up in the two new engineering universities established in lahore and dhaka the first batch of architects graduated from university of engineering and technology lahore in 1967 subsequently the school of architecture karachi was merged into daud college of engineering and technology now known as daud university 
the four-year program was upgraded and its first graduates came out in 1973. Seven years later, in 1980, the newly established Mehran University um, in ja Jamshur or Hyderabad started an architecture department. And in 1990, the Indus Valley School of Art and Architecture, Karachi, became the fifth school of architecture and which was the first in the private sector. Now, until 1990, there were only five schools. Then come 2010, that's 20 years later, there were still seven accredited schools of architecture at that time, 2010, with about uh, five schools seeking accreditation. By the end of 2015, the number of accredited schools jumped to 18, and those seeking recognition to 14. Today, there are 35 schools of architecture, of which 31 are accredited or in the process of seeking accreditation, majority in the public sector. The number of students studying today in the architecture schools is 1400 plus of which approximately 1200 graduate each year now these are the statistics of the number of schools the number of students and how um, over the last 10 years or so there's been um, a spate of uh, you know new schools that have come up with the whole lot of problems that accompany. When you have new schools, you need teachers. And when you have teachers, you uh, have to have trained teachers. Otherwise, um, what are you teaching? In the 70s and 80s, the four schools imparting architectural education in Pakistan at that time, like in most Commonwealth countries, followed the British model with a massive increase in urban population and the myriad problems associated uh, with uh, urbanization, the academia and practice were ill-equipped and at a loss to deal with the rapid deterioration of the urban fabric. Their role traditionally was to design buildings and anything beyond that was not considered within their domain. They had been trained to design a quality building in terms of its form and aesthetics fitting in the function. There seemed to be a general lack of understanding about the role and involvement of the profession in the quality of the built environment and in the enhancement of the quality of life of the citizens. Recognizing that the existing curricular structure was not fully geared to incorporate the study of the unprecedented and dynamic conditions prevalent in Karachi at that time, late Professor Javed Heather, then a young studio teacher at the Department of Architecture at Dawood's College, began developing a new integrated approach to design studio teaching. The underlying premise of the studio course according to Professor Heather, was that the profound changes undergoing at that time could not be fully comprehended and addressed through existing architectural paradigms and necessitated the creation of transformative pedagogies. The new method, according to him, had to take into consideration the inability of architects to address these real and vital issues which needed to be incorporated into a framework of an integrated approach in education and practice to create more responsive human environments. This approach to architectural design reversed the traditional model and shifted the focus from the predilection of the designer to create a unique form that distinguished itself from its surroundings to an approach that called for integration of design into a broader context. Architecture and design have to be recognized as interdisciplinary endeavors 
that not only deal with what is, but more critically, crucially, what ought to be. A state not subject to observation, but to prediction, imagination, exploration, and speculation. The traditional model emphasizes on physical form based on the designer's values, notions of aesthetics, or principles of visual organization. The impact on the user, often represented by a different entity, is generally ignored. More importantly, the process ignores historical, social, cultural, contextual, experiential, and physical characteristics of the environment. The Comprehensive Environment Design course was introduced at Daoud College in 1979, concerned with the enhancement of human experience and quality of life. Logically, the program focused more towards the marginalized communities, slum dwellers, and unplanned settlements. With little or no literature, research, or precedence of design intervention available to build upon, it was vital to think of the genesis of a unified field of inquiry, and thus the task of generating knowledge and simultaneously learning became an integral part of the studio process with both students and faculty carrying out research through the creation of a pedagogical structure that challenged boundaries between students and teachers and between peers. The CED course was subsequently adopted with modifications by some other schools. It is still a model that, uh, it is a model that still makes sense in the context of Pakistan, where design-related scholarship is sadly still very minimal. Uh, I know of a number of uh, schools which have uh, adopted this uh, in their curriculum, uh, perhaps not in a formal way, but uh, there, there are a number of schools who are, who are following this, and uh, um, which is a good sign, really. The modern movement of the 1960s and 70s and its successor, the reactionary movement emanating from the West have played havoc directly or indirectly with the architecture of the developing countries, particularly in South Asia. Whether it was successful or not in the West is a moot point, though subsequently the theories that were touted have been questioned and criticized that placed um, criticized and the dissenting professionals have expressed their disillusionment with traditions that placed undue emphasis on aesthetics form and beauty without regard to the user aspirations and needs the dissenters argued that architects were abdicating the responsibility by creating oppressive inhuman settlement environments. The architecture that the modern revolution has created is without a soul, totally unmindful of context. Sadly, successive generations of architects from the developing world have unquestioningly aped and continue to follow the so-called icons produced by these movements. Worse still, the new playground of the big boys moved closer home to the rich Arab states where, given the freedom and full reign, they have created architecture that has neither respect or relevance to the context nor the region's history or its culture. Many of our architects, enamored by the glitz, glamour and the iconic names associated with these projects, purportedly representing modernism and progress, have blindly followed in their footsteps, unmindful of the great damage that has been inflicted on the built environment of our cities in recent years. Sadly, this fascination for the chic also permeates through the classrooms of a majority of our schools. For many years, I've been invited by different schools across Pakistan to judge their um, 
students final year projects the one common comment i make almost without exception is that the precedent projects that students present are invariably all designed by star architects from the west they just see the pretty pictures but are generally ignorant of the context and thus unable to relate these precedents to their own projects in terms of place climate history society and economy it is fine to study and learn from foreign examples but the lessons learned have to be adapted to local conditions the most crucial aspect that is lacking in our schools most of our schools and for that matter also in practice relates back to critical thinking skills whatever we adapt or emulate from the west must be critically examined students need to appreciate that one does not go to university to praise and worship what is known but to question it the existing complexities of the urban sprawl in our cities where at least uh, where at one end of the spectrum chaos reigns and deplorable inhuman conditions prevail in the slums and at the other end the upscale housing societies and insular gated communities exist all part of the urban melting pot is there a role that an architect can play in addressing these disparities and to what extent and how can the academia in architecture schools contribute to remedy this education and training need to be clearly distinguished it is the responsibility of the faculty to ensure that in addition to preparing them for the profession they educate individuals who will be productive citizens socially responsible and professionally responsible at the same time the mindset of the practicing professional must also change practitioners have generally laid emphasis on training so that fresh graduates are ideally suited for immediate employment in commercial practices uh, akilsa excuse me uh, sorry I, i'd like to request if you could wind up please because uh, we're running a bit short on time thank you one, so much one minute more okay okay thank you um now it is for the profession to share with the academy the responsibility of educating the architect in addition to training him the schools cannot be expected to teach everything at the undergraduate level and hence much of the ongoing debate centers around two broad, broad viewpoints there are the proponents of a broad based interdisciplinary holistic approach to teaching where a student is given sufficient independence to pursue his own interest within a given framework this does not however absolve the teacher of his responsibility his task becomes more demanding and challenging which is to encourage the students to observe reflect and design their own process of learning the other viewpoint increasingly being pushed more so by the profession to address diversity is through structural changes from a five year integrated program to a 3 plus 2 model in which for the first 3 years the basis basics of architecture are taught and a certificate to that effect is awarded the student has to take a minimum break of 1 year to do an internship after which he has a choice to quit the program or to rejoin the school to complete the next 2 years in a specialization of his choice now these these um, are more specific for pakistan that i'm talking about although there are inherent logistical accreditation and other issues that are very likely to surface it is a model worth exploring because of the proliferation of new schools although there are well founded concerns about standards there is a tremendous scope for change in the teaching paradigms there is already some soul searching amongst the charged young faculty who will undoubtedly take the lead to redefine the relationship between training and education they are our hopes thank you 
Thank you very much, Akusab, for a very, very inspiring uh, dialogue, uh, which we are really looking forward to coming back to. Uh, now, I would like to uh, invite our last panelist, architect Asim Hamid, um, uh, to come uh, and share his screen after I'm done with his introduction. So Asim graduated in architecture uh, <clears throat> uh, with, uh, with a distinction from the National College of Arts. Uh, with his interests surrounding associated design and digital tectonics. A master's thesis on self-sufficient habitats shifted his research's focus towards the confluence of new media and the built environment, which led him to a second master's degree in media technology. He's presently a PhD fellow in immersive media and technology at, in IES NTNU in Norway. Um, Asim, the floor is all yours. Thank you. I'm sharing my screen. I wonder if you could see it. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity and I thank my fellow panelists. Okay. for their Awesome. Time. I'd like to request if you could speak up a bit. Your voice is just coming a bit unclear. Yeah, uh, I thank you for the opportunity and I thank my fellow panelists for their thought provoking uh, um, talks. Uh, I will jump, jump right into it. Um, so I'm going to structure my talk around three um, parts. So it's a state of affairs, identifying issues and a way forward. And in the state of affairs, I would like to first speak about the architectural, the reality of architectural practice. So if one is to make an argument that it is the job of the education to train students for practice, then we need to first understand what the reality of the practice is. And as Rahul Saab uh, pointed out quite uh, uh, promptly that it's intricately tied to inpatient capital. So if you look at Pakistan, we've got a 315 billion um, GDP um, and architecture either it's, it's a part of either services or the construction industry um, and both of them are growing sectors. So what does that mean for architectural uh, practices and what is the share and the contribution that they make to it? Uh, and to answer these questions, we have two bodies. So the PCAP-P, which is mandated by the government of Pakistan to regulate and serve the public uh, and the IAP, which, is, uh, which has a paying membership, and it is there to facilitate uh, the profession. Um, well, in practice, we actually find the duplication of goals and objectives between the two. Um, but if you understand, if you look at Pakistan, and if you look at uh, the figures that we get from uh, PCAT-P, we have got around 9,000 architects. That makes it one ratio 30,000 number of architects per population. And you can contrast that to Sri Lanka and India. That's around 15,000 and Europe, one ratio, 1,000. If we look at the data and figures and we ask some questions, so for the 9,000, what is the employment status of these architects? We don't know the number of employments per sector. We don't know the contribution to other employments, white, brown, and blue, we don't know. Uh, ratio of private practices, partnerships, and enterprises, we don't know number of unlicensed private practices, we don't know projects undertaken per year, we don't know share ratio, we don't know yearly finances, we don't know overall financial distribution, construction industry versus the services sector, we just don't know. Basic demographics for the architects, we don't know. So when we speak about the reality of architectural practice or the share of architectural practice in the growing services and construction industry, well, in the absence of any information and financial figures, a comment is at best assumptive. But what we do know are some of the wage rates and a wage rate is usually taken as a indication of the strength of an industry. And at present an entry level architect, and this is from word of mouth, uh, earns anywhere around 450,000 per year, and that's at best, that's the best promising, that's $2,500 um, per year. And if you consider education costs, that's uh, 1.0 or 1 million at the lowest to around 3 million at the highest, that would take around five years for any architect to, a uh, graduating architect to break even if they're saving all of that money. Um, so one can imagine, I mean, in summation, you could say, well, PCAT, and IAP, they need to conduct a serious and exhaustive survey in order to first assess the reality of the profession. Moving on to the reality of the education, we know that architectural education in Pakistan in effect actually refers to undergraduate program because we've got 35 undergraduate accredited program, the master's and the doctoral programs in total are barely eight. And for these 35 programs, they all follow one strict predefined centrally controlled curriculum and both of those and all of that is under the auspices of IAP and PCAT-P. So the IAP and PCAT-P have taken it upon themselves to not just facilitate an aid education, but they have also decided to set it up, frame it, and implement it. And now with the BAE, we have three bodies trying to do the same. So in effect, they want, 
they, you know, they control what we teach, they control how we teach it, and they control when to teach it. And most of that education model follows the master atelier and, you know, the pedagogy kind of revolves around direct supervision, monitored cultivation and stylistic mannerism. If you look at the micro view and you try to identify the issues, then you could say, well, you know, you could look at program formation. So you could say, well, instead of a five year, let's do a three plus two or a four plus two. Let's look at product based versus concern based versus process based course contents. Let's look at didactic versus dialectics, pedagogical versus andragogical, and so on and so forth. We can talk about examination, certifications, tools and media, et cetera. But all of these, they hit at the symptoms and not the cause. The cause is more of an ontological, ontological inquiry. And that is, what is the nature of architecture in Pakistan? Which I must say, architecture is only a field in Pakistan and it's not still a discipline. It is not yet a discipline. In fact, it's far away from being one. 35 undergraduate programs, they barely bother the threshold uh, for making a discipline. So at the macro, one needs to acknowledge that universities are, um, are bodies or institutes that push the discipline forward through the development of knowledge, inward criticality, and reflecting a more favorable research environment. Because a field, it is natural for a field to assume that the role of education is not to be good in itself, but to provide a regular supplier fodder for the market and the trade. And just to quote um, to, you know, to, uh, uh, so Griffith 2019 out of Yale, it is emphatically not the job of architecture to education to mimic practice or somebody local, Irfan Ghani, who, who, who would say, well, practice, to inculcate practice, that is the job of practice and not schools. Let's try to understand this from the point of view of an architect within the built environment uh, that uh, Rahul also spoke of or uh, Akil Saab spoke of. Now, within that environment, you have a practicing architect like Buchanan who, uh, who actually criticizes the state of architectural education and says, well, it follows a very, um, it, it follows a non-current and not non-credible a role model, and that is the architect who assumes, the architect assuming that he is an elite professional, independent or superior to the building industry, when in fact the architect is in today's complex industry, just another team player and he has to be or she has to be a part of a team. To understand this in terms of the built environment, the built environment we need to understand is an interdisciplinary uh, milieu of, of a host of things. So the inter the built environment is public policy, it's law, it's economics. It is controlled by, it draws from all of these different interdisciplinary fields. And right now as a field, the only participation or the voice that we have in the built environment is that of the sole practitioner, the architect. But as a discipline, we have the opportunity and we have the scope to be able to have diverse voices. And all of those voices would be trained uh, would have the know-how of, of the discipline, they would know the theory of the discipline, they would know about the research of the discipline, and they would be able to integrate um, and to be able to interact with the built environment in a much more um, efficient manner, I would presume. So to move on, I would say that first we need to define a vision towards the discipline, and then for everyone to kind of work within their scopes, respect the autonomy of educational institutions, incentivize them to build a body of knowledge, facilitate collaboration, research, and innovation. And with that, I'd end. I hope I met the 78 minutes. Okay, Asim, thank you wow, so much. Thank you. Thank you, Nabha. I'll take it from here. So what a wonderful uh, series, an engaging series of uh, presentations and talks we've had just now. And my Q&A box is brimming with questions. So I'd like to start with Rahul. Now, Rahul, you showed a very interesting slide which showed us uh, the, how the organized real estate sector is inversely the proportional to the demand of, of architects in the industry. Also, you talked about the lens which, with, with which we see architecture from and the study of temporal movement of urbanism um, and the architecture of flux. In terms of education, should we be moving towards looking into thematic challenges of climate change, temporal scenarios, uh, quality of life? Should architecture schools be uh, 
curating their curriculum in, uh, around these thematic practices and uh, or the architecture schools should stimul simulate the practice well, which they are uh, getting the students ready for. So there, there, are, many, there are many questions in your comments. <laughs> you sort of <laughs> collapse many questions on the question and answer. So I'll, let, me, let me try to pick up your last one because I was, I think what Asim sort of uh, framed was very good. Uh, I think Akhil used, he was, Akhil was so direct, he said fodder. Uh, and, uh, and then I think Asim uh, he kind of, uh, I think, uh, let me say, framed it um, in, I think for me, a very productive way, uh, which is, I mean, the question of field versus discipline, no? Uh, I think that Asim really is well put because that's the heart of the problem. Uh, you know, are we responding to creating as Akhil showed us historically, uh, just assistance for uh, firms or for people qualified from elsewhere to kind of produce architecture here? Or are we trying to, through education, also craft a, a discipline? And at least for me, in very simplistic ways, uh, what would the difference be? Uh, and the difference would be a, dif a, a discipline has to necessarily have a body of theory that it begins to kind of keep referring to. And theory is also not static. Theory is about creating feedback loops. Theory is about framing what we see on the ground in a way that we can operate uh, conceptually, ideologically in particular ways. Uh, and so I think one big contribution at least in South Asia, I think it's beginning to happen in different parts. Uh, is 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 this is this is this notion of looking at it as a discipline, and I think that disciplinary construction can only happen in the academy, and that is probably the biggest contribution of the schools, uh, which is where research becomes important, uh, which is where we begin to define what I was calling the context of the context that becomes very important, where the construction of theory becomes very important, where studying at a higher level, that is your PhD programs, your masters, all that become very important because those really then set up the framework for us to kind of look at it as a discipline, which then begins to respond to all the aspirations that all of us as panelists have defined uh, in terms of what architects should do. Um, and so I think that I, I would just like to flag that and kind of compliment our same in the way he kind of framed this. Uh, I, I mean, I think maybe that answers at least your last question. I'm happy to answer many others in the question, but you tell me when. Sure, so we'll take a couple of more questions. There are many for you in the Q&A box, so I'll come back to you later, but uh, uh, our other panelists, if they want to answer this question, uh, they're invited to please speak. Or, the, or they want to comment on this? I think, I, I, I think for myself, I think Rahul kind of, uh, I mean, right there, Rahul Saab kind of framed it in a, it's, it's theory and, of course, I mean, it's, uh, so you have, you have a profession, and with the profession, then you've got academia, and then these two speak to one another. But you need to understand that in a wider, um, in a wider societal manner as well, because universities uh, are not in isolation. They're not, they're not alien to what happens in the society. And I think what Rahul wants to point uh, is, is really kind of like pointing out there is this dialogue between all of these, this fluxes is kind of this constant tension between these deep, these different bodies uh, that we understand as civilization. Um, and, and within that, discipline then becomes the only kind of platform in which you could negotiate with all of these different disciplines or with these different bodies, because as a field, it becomes very hard to kind of negotiate that. Um, you just don't have the right tools, or it's not even about having the right tools only. It's just the number of tools and the opportunities, just it's, it's limited. And yeah, it's... Is that taking too much on an architect's plate? No, it's not as, an architect. As an individual uh, in the society. No, I don't think it's an architect's plate. I think we misunderstand. The role of the architect is not to take all of that on his or her plate. Uh, it is the role of institutions. It is the role of bodies to take it collectively. Architect, as we understood it, um, the role some 50 years back, the master architect is no wrong, longer relevant. I think everyone understands that. And that is why we're having this this webinar, uh, if we continue to go on that line where we think the, archi the architect has answers to everything, that's just, 
It's a fallacy, it's not true. And which is why you need researchers, you need inter, when we speak of interdisciplinarity, we don't mean within the discipline itself. Right now, we are talking about having no discipline, but even interdisciplinarity means speaking to others outside the discipline. So for an architect to think or even imagine that we could solve these issues by ourselves, I think, yeah, no, that's a dangerous proposition. But, you know, just to illustrate that, just to uh, uh, say that. So, for example, really, if you take architecture more globally, it is very much a discipline. Uh, we might uh, be on the edge of it uh, in, in terms of the relevance for South Asia, but it is a discipline. I would say you take something like urban planning. Uh, planning is clearly a discipline. Both these both these disciplines have self, sometimes self-referential, but sometimes theoretical frameworks which guide it. Now you debunk theory sometimes, you construct new theory. Sometimes theory gets very static and it's not useful. But then if I take something like urban design, urban design is actually a field or a practice. Uh, it is a bridging practice between architecture and urban uh, and, and planning. And if you look at urban design, there is really very little theory that frames it. In fact, those of us who teach urban design keep despairing that I think if we have to make urban design a discipline, we need a theoretical framework. I mean, Kevin Lynch's book on the image of the city is not enough. And so uh, then it stays as a bridge practice. Then it becomes a practice or a field of practice, uh, which is very specific in what it's kind of delivering in terms of creating these bridges. So, so I think, um, again, to, I'm sorry to keep going back and forth and we should move on to Asim's point is that these disciplines form out of, uh, out of many forces that coalesce together and then find frameworks to self-reflect so that they create an armature within which one can operate as a field. Uh, and that synergy uh, actually is what um, is critical for the health of these fields, these disciplines, as well as these practices. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you, Asim. I think Nava has a question. Yeah, um, so my question now is to um, Jivanti. So you, towards the end of your presentation, spoke about like what if or what could happen. So what could actually happen from your perspective as a practitioner or as a teacher? Um, how, if we were to teach students to be more engaged, to be more inclusive, or if they were taught to focus on forming future architecture as opposed to this, uh, just the face of the hollowness of uh, hollow buildings devoid of being relative uh, to what is happening in the now. How do you think, what is the way forward for that? Like, where do you think the idea of, um, where, where do you think the schools and then the practice actually has to make that shift forward? In fact, um, like creating the, the talking points that you sent earlier, I was just going through and thinking, yes, we have been as, uh, as education sectors for over so many years, we have been practicing the best curriculum, or we have we have never had a curriculum of our own to practice. So we have been following the Western theories, we have been following the RIB uh, syllabuses, and so on and so forth. What I thought is that uh, when I saw this discussion and when I followed the talking points that you sent, I did, just did some reading. And I thought, yes, even though we, we do not have our own theories, even though we do not, we have very few research of our own, we have very good, rich culture and history. So what if after getting the right education from all around the world, that's totally all right, but then what if we also refer to ourselves and do more research on that find new ways to address our own issues in our own way. Can't we like, have our own theories finally? Can't we have our own architecture? And can't we have our own little world within our country? Because our country, as you know, is an island. And we have some 1,500 architects only still, and only four, uh, five institutes, two institutes accepted by the Institute of Architects. Uh, to teach architecture and four listed schools, we have very few architects. But 
looking at our surroundings, looking at our cityscapes, the damage is not small. So I think, I think that we just have to refer back. It may be true at some point certain architects have gotten up as uh, Asim just mentioned that after 60 years, maybe some architects could be gotten, but the basic essence of life is not forgotten. Humanity is being able to be able to do something with the sensitivity, uh, being able to understand certain things, uh, being able to live within certain things, we never change. So I think we have to learn those things first. And when it comes to Sri Lanka, we have the background, only we have to turn back and um, just be sensitive to it. So it will make a huge change, huge difference. Whereas, for instance, in Sri Lanka, there are residential schemes coming in. By the residential schemes, the culture is changed, the subculture is changed. By the way we follow slavishly the other architects or other nations' architecture, we change our subculture. Why should we? That's my question. So if we have been more sensitive towards those things, we could have changed it. We could have still have the solutions for our housing problems, for our urbanism, for our urban exclusions, but still retain our own rich uh, culture and a good environment, finally. That's what I believe. And then, uh, if, I, if I'm to add a little bit more, I also believe uh, that the education, not only architecture education, even the elementary education, primary, secondary, elementary education, should include certain things that would give this sen sensitivity towards the uh, child to be able to see something, admire something, feel something, and be uh, sensitive towards this. Then only, not only an architect, but all the other profession, then only you can uh, get the true sense from that child. Am I clear? Naba? Naba, can you hear us? Yeah. Okay. So any of the panelists would like to comment on this? Uh, maybe I'm having a bit of a problem. Okay, so um, right. I'm going to pick up on... Uh... I think Naba is lagging a little bit. Akil Saab, I have a question for you in the meantime. So um, you gave us a very apt uh, overview of the condition of the pedagogy and the practice. You can hear me, right? Okay. Again. So, okay, I was just wondering. Um, okay, so it all begins with the pedagogy. Now, uh, the teachers who spark the imagination and who lead to the exploration uh, of the student's mind. How, what is our criteria of selection of teachers? Where does one begin teaching in their professional um, experience or their careers? Should there be a teacher's training for architects? What are your thoughts on that? You see, unless the teacher has some spark in him or her, he cannot teach. There has to be that spark. Now, for you to select a teacher who has a spark is another <laughs> issue. How do you do that? But then, I suppose there are ways of determining. Teacher's training, I think, is very important because um, everyone can't teach. I mean, I taught for eight years, but I was, I think, a pretty bad teacher at the end of the day. Um, and I realized that initially I was very enthusiastic, but uh, later on, after the sixth or seventh or eighth year, uh, my um, evaluations sort of started going down. So I quit. <laughs> so um, you, you have to be you know, trained 
and particularly for studio teaching. The theoretical part, you know, the history, etc. It just has to be a good teacher who can engage the students. His history can be a very boring subject, but if you have a good teacher, it becomes fascinating. On the other hand, a studio teacher needs to be trained. Everybody can't become a studio teacher. You need to be trained because there you are inspiring the students. You're not teaching them anything. He's not supposed to teach you in a studio. He's supposed to inspire you. He's, he's supposed to uh, bring out the best in you. And then expose you to, to various uh, situations, expose you to, to, to history, to uh, what is around you, and you know, get that uh, uh, interest um, in your students. Rahul, would you like to comment on that? And then uh, Jivanti and Nasim too. We can't hear you, Rahul. Yeah. No, no, I was just reading some of the questions. And so maybe I'll kind of, uh, uh, I'll pick up on this, but I just want to, because I think those questions were very important. There was one, there were three questions that I just want to pick up because that might help our conversation too. One was a question that how does, how do we then include, in, in, increase our sphere of influence? Because I'd written that. The second question was, what is the role of the ephemeral and how will we use it more? And then third was that, what would be the difference between the rural and the urban? And how would we prepare ourselves? And I think it sort of re relates both to what uh, uh, Jawanti has said and Akhil too, uh, in terms of culture and things. So let me just use those three as very quickly to respond to them. So I think the role in terms of uh, increasing our sphere of influence, the way I would answer it is saying that, you know, we often, we often take the client as a very singular entity, the client. We are doing something for the client. And this is a thing I think perpetuates what Sim was referring to as the field, you know. Uh, that's what you're expected to do. But if you actually unpack what the client is, in every different situation and problem, there is many things rolled into the client. I would say the way I describe it is I think uh, it's you usually for any project, you have a patron client, you have an operational client and you have a user client, right? So the patron and now in a, in a weekend home, which is why we all do these weekend homes so effortlessly is in these weekend homes that it collapses into one entity, so it's frictionless, correct? But if you do a government project, the patron client would be the chief minister of the state or the district. Uh, uh, the operational client will be the public works department, uh, and the user client will be often uh, people from an economically weaker section who are occupying it who feel totally unempowered, right? So then the architect's role becomes very crucial because you are your responsibility, because these are the words as Akhil was sort of putting to us, there's a responsibility here, is to bridge the gap between all of them, to make it one entity, to be able to reflect everybody's aspirations, everybody's culture, not make architecture to dictate what culture and lifestyle they should follow, as Jyanti has sort of said. And so this is a huge responsibility. And I think if we begin to nuance our understanding of even who we deal with, which is the client, and see it in this more complex way, we will be speaking a different language with each one, right? So with the chief minister, you're talking a technocratic language, you're talking costs, you're talking efficiency, uh, right? The, oh, oh, no, oh, sorry, with the operational clients, you're talking costs and efficiency. With the patron client, you're talking aspirations. So how this is going to, madam, how this is going to change our lives and our identity and all of that. With the user clients, you're talking about their lifestyle and their culture. And it is our responsibility then to weave it together. Now, if I extend that into how do I make my influence greater, then I think as architects, we must begin to see ourselves as part of any civil society in any country within South Asia, or anywhere in the world. And civil society means, at least to me, means that part of society that has the ability to uh, understand the grassroots, again, to go to Jivanti's point, and also have the wherewithal, the confidence, the education, the culture to negotiate more powerful forces 
like the central governments or the World Bank who's doing a project, et cetera. And so we, you know, I think the metaphor of the bridge that is architects as bridges in society uh, that help us mold spatial possibilities uh, becomes a different imagination of what the architect should be. Now, this is for a young person entering the field. And I think if one takes a clue from it, there are many, many questions we can have for pedagogy in terms of how do we prepare people to do that, right? So I think that becomes a challenge. The second point I would just say on the ephemeral is that there's a whole spectrum. I think my argument is really that we must look, we, time has been absent in architecture and planning and in imagination. And so the ephemeral for me is on a spectrum. There are things that are ephemeral on a four hour cycle or a 12 hour cycle. There are things that are ephemeral on a 10 year cycle. There are things like a 12 year cycle, like the Kum Mela. There are markets that happen every day. There are mining towns that disappear every 50 years. So we must bring time into our imagination. So for example, I often say in third year, we should ask students to go to Akhil's point about inspiration and challenges. We should ask students to design a weekend home for a client, but a weekend home that would last only for 10 years and then all that material can be reabsorbed into the landscape. That's a completely different challenge from saying, design a weekend home and then we are talking about permanence. We're saying, how is, will this last for a hundred years? I mean, it changes completely the way we imagine things. So how do we bring time as an imaginary into our pedagogy and into our own practices and our own values. Yeah. And then the last one was the rural urban. I would actually argue that the binary is not relevant for us at all in South Asia any longer because of this movement and flux because of technology. Uh, we must now look at scale. We must look at towns and settlements of a thousand people, 5,000 people. I mean, people have mentioned landscape urbanism as one of your interests. There's a complete blur now between what is urban and rural. It's a different condition. Uh, and I think pedagogy has to respond to that. So I don't think there's an answer about what we should do in the rural and what we should do in the urban, but we should now look at much more these landscapes because of technology, because of the way society has changed uh, are actually much more about movement and, and, and flux. And therefore the imagination of time and temporality becomes a useful way of Im imagining this. Thanks. Thank if you. I could just, if I could just pick that up there. Yeah. And, uh, uh, it's, sure. it's because uh, uh, Rahul mentions this, this universal civilization almost uh, of, of how do you resist it in a way um, at a more cultural level. Um, and, and, and just because every time this sort of a thing happens, and I've been a part of, you know, these IP organized where we have architects coming in from South Asia or from elsewhere, there's this one thing that we need to realize as Pakistanis about our society is the hyper normal reality of Pakistan is it's not the same as the rest of the countries like Sri Lanka and India. And, and Rahul touched upon citizenry, and I must say that citizenry is a confined concept in Pakistan. To suggest that we have citizenry, active citizenry, to suggest that we have anything which is this, a civil body is, is, as a concept, of course, we do. But to think that we have it in the kind of vibrancy that they enjoy in the rest of the countries around us is, is again, a very, and I don't want to dwell uh, uh, more into it, but with that is the whole idea of there was a question within the Q&A of, of identity or, or Akhil Saab's point of how do you find these students, where do or these teachers, where do they come from, this, this kind of passion for things. We need to, there is a reality to Pakistan where we know that the economics of the built environment, the urban or the rural are controlled by a certain class and not by a class, I mean by a certain force uh, and a certain establishment. That reality, that, that patron that you're talking about, that client that you're talking about is by and large that one client. That client controls how we build cities, that client controls, and by, by that establishment controls how we live, that establishment controls how we identify with things, what cultures are. So when we say all of that, to be able to, and I, I, I can understand why it must be hard for some of our colleagues from, you know, from our neighboring countries, that democracy is vital to the idea of citizenry or the idea of using the architect as a tool for that. What, what I'm trying to say is that no, of course it can happen. Of course he could be a tool or she could be a tool to it. The problem is that when you have, when you have a situation where your patron is one establishment or your patron or that one establishment kind of 
overpowers the rest of the built environment, it, it becomes very hard to then talk about these, act, the, these active citizenry or these actions um, as, as stakeholders, yeah. No, no. I mean, of course, one totally understands that point. And actually, I would argue what you're describing. I think it's like we're ships in the dark where you're coming from. We are going to in India in many ways, uh, in, in just <laughs> with what I see happening. But, you know, I think, Asim, I, I think uh, the, the uh, and you're right, you're right in your description. But what I would say is that, look, identity, culture, these are not static. They're being constructed all the time, correct? And so if, if you give me the condition of patronage that you're describing, actually my instrumentality is different. I might, my, I might actually be doing much more speculative stuff as an architect and as agent, and it might be slow change, but it's actually just the responsibility of imagining better spatial possibilities. Because you know, even patronage will change. I mean, don't. I mean, we can't. We can't afford to. If we lose that optimism, we are done. Because we can't afford to even think that culture or identity or even patronage and its forms are so static. They're going yeah, to change. Uh, They're going yeah, to change. The it's, only it's, reason I bring the only reason I bring it up is because we don't have a dialogue of that sort happening in Pakistan. There is no but, recognition for it. Yeah, but we must because I mean I think it's it's all this thinking collectively that changes society finally. I mean to Javanti's point that we have to dig into what might be better possibilities using our own culture. It's it's a slow process, and you know there are histories of this that have happened before in parts of Europe and other parts where architects at that moment become very speculative and speculative. I don't mean in the real estate. Sense, but speculative about imagining, let's say, utopia. Uh, and that helps, that propels society in some ways, too. Do, do, do you think architects uh, have a political part to play? Do you think there is the politics of- Asim, you want to take over my job? <laughs> I don't know. It's, 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 I thought it I could ask him because it's, it, it just comes down to that. So I'm just, okay, I wanted Absolutely. It is a completely political act. And that's the reason why I think we can't fool ourselves when we talk about our clients. We've got to deconstruct our clients and slice our clients down to all the components and then see who we are responding to. We make this, it's an illusion when we think of the client as a, as a singular entity. Okay, so um, I'd like to actually now lead this into a couple of questions from the chat box because I feel this is a very relevant point that everyone has raised because the idea actually boils down pretty much to context and then what we have and what we consider to be an idea of us or our if you look at it on a very regional perspective because as Jivanti had also stated earlier um, and Akil Saab and like everyone at some point that we tend to contextualize our architecture based on a very western premise uh, whereby, because we, for whatever reasons, are lacking in architectural theory that has actually originated from our South Asian uh, uh, context. And so, uh, two questions here, which I've got. Uh, one is from uh, Vakar Aziz, where uh, he's asking that identity is an issue and most of the work of in or inquiry into architecture still revolves around it. So, what are your thoughts about how to frame the issue of Hour because that does then that does connect with what is taught in the studio and then that when you when the student graduates translates into practice as well. Um, Akil, we start is that up with you me? or Jivanti. Uh, who yeah. wants to go? Is that for me? Uh, anyone can start up, Jivanti. Yeah. Please, we we'll start with you and then I'll could move on. Please, with uh, could you please repeat the question? I yeah. just uh, part of yeah. that I didn't catch. Yeah. Okay, identity is an important issue and most of the work or inquiry into architecture still revolves around it. What are your thoughts about how to frame the issue of our, primarily because we have to address this in some capacity in the studio and like we've said, we are kind of lacking and this then leads off into what is actually being practiced and then what is coming up in the built environment that we see around ourselves. So how do we frame the issue of our, how can we address this? In a way, uh, as uh, architect uh, Mehotra said, that uh, ours could keep changing. It cannot be completely static or completely it all the time. But the thing is, what is the essence of it? So I personally believe that we have to keep a certain essence within it 
while we are changing with time, with the moving trends, uh, with the so many other influences we are getting from the outside world and all that, we have to somewhat change it. We have to, uh, um, how, how should I say it? We have to make it ours. Right? It's not that even though I uh, took that very ancient example from eight, uh, 1800s, that we have to make the same thing over and over again. But the people's needs, how they would look at the world, and how would they aspire, how would they like to be, uh, would change. But there's this aspect that would never change as well, like the sensitivity, like the humanity, like a certain minute parts of our subculture that should remain to make us different from the others, like language, right? If all of us spoke the same language, the world would have been a very dull place, right? So all of us would be expressing the same way, all the poems, all the fiction, all the uh, nice prose will be uh, written in the same language, and there won't be many interpretations, and there are, it, it will be a dark place. So likewise, uh, uh, I think, so for that, in education, I think, yeah, it's a, it's a, the, the teachers hold a great, like they have a, they, they have a huge responsibility of do, delivering it, right? Delivering it. Teachers are, as uh, the architect Akhil Bilrami said, Teachers are just not the people who will just uh, repeat what they learn. There are people who would learn and who would deliver what they learn every day. And they are the great inspirers. So I believe that the teacher, I'm also a teacher now, but I've been in the practice continuously for more than the nearly two decades. And when I started teaching, the first thing I uh, realized was, despite my practice, despite the practice I was exposed to, teaching is quite different, very inspirational, very important, new journey for me to inspire my student. Thank right? you. In the practice, we don't inspire. In the practice, actually, we... Uh, uh, we try to do something that we believe in. But in teaching, what we do is we try to let the student do something he or she believes. Thank so that's you, Auntie. Thank you for these very profound words. Uh, Rahul, Asim, and Akil Sab, uh, we're nearing the end of our session right now. So I would like uh, uh, each of you to just, if you could just kind of compress this in one or two sentences, what we were talking about. Asim? I, I just want to say that our does I mean it our doesn't belong to a school, a university, or a discipline. Our belongs to the people. Um, and it is it is it is a thing of plurality, it is a thing of multiplicity, especially in South Asia or <laughs> the world. When we say our, when I think of Pakistan, we mean starting from Gilgit all the way to Karachi, we mean all of the pluralities that are within it. And and we see in the context of our country, we see that time and again that concept of ours or that multiplicity has been clipped, it has been debauched, it has been played with to bring it down to a unitary. And that's what I'm constantly trying to say, that it's it's when you have something like that, that is it it is then more than a role of an educational institution to say to, you know, what what ours is, because then it becomes I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, and you know, Akhil Sab and Rahul Sab would go and Jivanti, then it becomes the role of those institutions to fight for that hour. It is not to define it just, but to fight for it, to train people to say what the fight as an architect or as a thinking person, what is that fight? How would you fight it and who do you fight? How do you bring back that multiplicity or plurality to ours or our and not let the powers to be control it? Thank you, Asim. And Rahul? Uh, no, I think just to pick up on Jivanti and Asim's, uh, Asim's points. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, I, you know, that one slide that Jivanti had of six cities that all look the same, 
it's actually there's a tyranny of images and we've got to separate images and values right so i think the question of identity which was the last question i think identity comes from what we identify with in terms of values uh, and that gives us our identity uh, and i think that is very important to know because identity is constructed it's not a found thing we don't dig into our history to find our identity because identity keeps changing uh, and then i think as an extension of that plurality is about how that difference can change each other it's just not about the coexistence of this difference per se because that's an easy one to map uh, but how that difference friends can transgress and change each other and of course it all comes down to the politics of a place uh, to be able to do that but i mean i think my final message would be that i think for pedagogy what's very important to recognize is the changing nature of everything whether it's culture which is made every day whether it's identity which is constructed every day and also the question of separating values and images identifying with values will give you certain images but every image need not be should not be taken for its face value because it often does not encode all the values that we think it encodes uh, and so i think for teaching and for teachers and for pedagogy generally these are very critical questions thank you thank you and if you'll sir just a few words from you to conclude okay of identity um we don't have a national really national identity we still still struggling with that um we don't know if we are looking at the west um we looking at uh, uh, the arabs or we are looking at our own history uh, our historical sort of uh, um uh, perspective precedents um we we don't know where we stand i mean i'm talking of pakistan and without that identity it is very difficult to also then define an architectural identity or to arrive at some uh, architectural identity because this is not a settled matter i know that uh, identity is something dynamic uh, in the sense uh, that uh, major changes in our sort of national outlook started with the the martial law of 1977 things changed gradually and became more or less permanent now you are greeting people the way that the arabs greet it has never happened in a thousand years and suddenly in these last few years this change has taken place so and there is obviously um there there there's a strong lobby which opposes this but uh, then as i said uh, we are sort of in a flux we don't know where we are uh there's just one more small comment i want to make and that is about uh, uh, the influence the external influences um on uh, architectural education or uh, really the practice of architecture um one of them is uh, the government itself there are so many um laws and uh, other um um other you know promulgation of the various uh, laws the thinking of the government which actually without us knowing affects our teaching our affects our teachers affects the architecture and affects there's so many um and then there are other influences as well which uh, um, commercial for instance you have uh, your your clients the the big money that comes in and uh, dictates um you what you should be doing and what you should not be doing and unfortunately architects that come to it they have to because with uh, their doing commercial practice they have to given some of them do given some of them do not but then uh, it it does affect the architecture of uh, um, you know it, the, the the environment the built environment is uh, affected by that tell me thanks thank you oh i think we lost him a bit over there okay um so i'd like to invite uh, mishal to please come and 
close uh, the session, give the closing points. Excuse Thank me, you. Naba. Uh, yeah. Uh, can I be na Naba? Yeah, yeah. I just uh, I was scrolling down my this uh, Q and A uh, this thing, and I can see a um, uh, question posed for me by architect Jayanti Perera, very senior architect from Sri Lanka. Um, actually, um, I'm supposed to say this. I never said that. There are four accredited schools in Sri Lanka. We have two accredited schools, architecture schools in Sri Lanka, and the two others are not accredited by uh, Sri Lanka Institute of Architects. Okay, thank you. It, actually, he wanted me to uh, clarify that. Yeah, clarify that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no problem. Clarify no problem. that. It's, yeah. It's, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Michal, you're up. Yeah, thank you, Naba. So I will be concluding a few points because those are the only few points I could jot down uh, so quickly. Uh, otherwise, we are going to have a publication out of this, uh, this uh, three-part webinar series. But to conclude today's session, uh, we did have a discourse on understanding and unlayering discipline and field and how do we as institutions strengthen them both. Uh, then we looked at um, how to be in, uh, how can pedagogy pedagogy incorporate temporal scenarios uh, and changes of time in, in their uh, um, curricula. Understanding the client and breaking it down uh, is very important. Uh, regionalism has to be incorporated in the pedagogy, as the Gilsak said, that we have a very few illustrated. Uh, documented examples of our own uh, historic architecture. And we're always referring to those pretty pictures from the West. Uh, then we also talked about uh, breaking down the architecture program uh, into a three-year study plus one-year internship and two years education program. Uh, we also talked about teachers training and the people who are going to teach and uh, form these new minds uh, are, are a very important aspect of their personality and their careers. Um, and then students, as Jivanti said, have to be more engaged and inclusive on forming the future. Uh, we talked about plurality, multiplicity, and uh, identity, which I think could take three different sessions altogether. And uh, recognizing changing nature of everything pretty much concludes um, my understanding of today's session. And so I would now like to invite uh, BAEIP Chairperson Khatija Jamal to conclude the session. Thank you very much, um, Michelle. I would particularly like to thank each of the panelists by name, architect Rahul Marotra, who just on a phone call agreed to um, be part of this session. Actually, he was very excited and he felt this was going to be very relevant. And um, it's, it's, it's a question that he's also been looking at in his research uh, for the last many years. And his new book is also going to be looking at that. And we wait for that book. And Asim, um, I think our audience found you very fiery. And that was really good because you've come up with a lot of points which um, make us, which should make us reflect further. And Akhil Sab, you know, your history and telling us everything, how the schools developed in Pakistan and we, where we stand. And Jivanti brought in this uh, flavor from Sri Lanka, which kind of brought about this whole South Asia together. Uh, what I see is that um, in this entire discussion, what has happened is not that we have come up with any one aspect which we can say we have closed. In fact, we have raised so many more questions, and which is a huge challenge. And one of the things that has struck me is that how do we look at the relevance of the curriculum for architectural education today in South Asia, and particularly in Pakistan? Um, so uh, as we move along, you know, this webinar series is uh, not just about this one um, session today. Um, this whole aspect of the students, because the, the aspect why we started looking at this particular series of putting it together was there's a constant debate between practicing architects and academics. And the practicing architects are kind of, um, you know, uh, 
posing a challenge to the academic saying that um, the products, the products that come out of schools is not what, uh, what the practice demands. Now, this, uh, what, what are we looking at just a product, a robot coming out of it? Are we looking at thinkers and critical thinkers coming out of uh, uh, the education institution, which I think is, is the uh, aim of education because uh, Devanti touched upon, it's not about architectural education, but elementary education. So what are we doing with the minds of our young? And as we take, as they move into practice, Yes, this whole gambit of society and government and politics. Yes, all of that is part of the education as well. But um, one of the most important things I think we need to look at, apart from faculty, is also curriculum. Because are we looking at things which we should be looking at for South Asia? So we will move on in the next two uh, sessions. But I'm happy to note that uh, at the end of the three sessions, we would be coming up with an e-publication which we will then uh, share uh, with everyone. And at the end of it, while I thank you, thank everybody, we uh, would like, I would also like to take the liberty of saying that we may call upon all of you from time to time as we move along to face this challenge and to unpack and really come up with things to uh, come up with something which we can resolve the situation here or make it uh, in such a way that we move with the times. Um, here you see a poster now that uh, thank you very much all of you, but we move on. The next session will be next Saturday at the same time uh, with a new topic, learn, unlearn, and relearn with a new set of panelists. And I think we will have uh, also um, have a you know very dynamic uh, group of people going through the same kind of conversation. Thank you. Thank you really very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.